now we want to talk about the moons that are in our solar system and we're not going to cover all of them there are over a hundred moons they're all over the place um, you know it is uh, the number of moons out there around the planets it well actually it's a number that keeps growing because we keep discovering more around Jupiter and Saturn but we're just going to co cover sort of the, the larger moons and I'm not going to cover all of the ones in this slide. We're just going to go over some of the ones that are just um, um, really of note. Um, so Mercury and Venus um, have no moons. Mars has a couple. We have one. Uh, Jupiter has a bunch. Right? Neptune has a bunch. Saturn has a bunch. Um, but let's go over the ones of the the ones that you already know. Um, the, the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. All right? They're all somewhat different compositions. Some of them are rocky. Most of them are sort of icy blocks. Here's our moon, which is a rocky moon. Titan is the largest moon uh, around Saturn. Right? Titan's around Saturn. And then Triton out around Neptune. And you can see there's some other fairly sizable moons, big enough to be round. That's one of the things. The moons around Mars, while there are a couple, um, they're not really as round as the other moons. And the smaller a moon is, the less likely it is to be round. Because you've got to remember, it's gravity that makes it round. And without enough gravity, it just doesn't become round. Uh, if we look at how big Ganymede is, it's 5268 kilometers in diameter. So it's a little bit bigger than Titan, right? Just a little bit bigger than Titan. A um, little bit heavier, or a little bit more mass than Titan. So Ganymede is the largest of them. Our moon, right? Our moon, 3476. Right? It's a pretty good sized moon. Not as big as Io, but bigger than Europa. Not as big as Callisto, but bigger than Triton. Right? So we kind of sit there in what that would make us one two three four fifth place in the solar system in terms of moon size if that matters um, if you look at how these compare to say uh, mercury well Ganymede and Titan are both larger than mercury All right both larger than mercury so that'll give you a, a little pause there oh we've got a planet that's smaller than these two moons right the other thing that's interesting to look at is their density so our moon Io uh, Europa are fairly dense uh, but then Ganymede Callisto Titan not as dense and Triton's a little more dense but not still down in this range right not as dense it's because these these moons are more icy and these are more rocky so moon, our moon Io and Europa more rocky Ganymede, Callisto, Titan and Triton more icy and by icy I mean uh, they're chunks of ice uh, water ice, methane ice you know the biggest biggest thing right now in terms of wondering about planets and you know, well, wondering about moons and uh, potential for life other, elsewhere is Europa. Actually, we now believe Europa has liquid oceans underneath um, underneath the surface. So you'll see um, you'll see talk in the popular press about maybe going to Europa to check it out to see what's going on there. And then you can watch the science fiction movie Europa Report about going there and, as usual. An expedition being destroyed by the life it finds. That's kind of you know a standard sci-fi theme. Um, so we got our rocky moons, we've got our icy moons, and um, you know you can now identify rocky versus icy. Now the reason Titan looks fuzzy here, right? When you look at these pictures, why is Titan fuzzy? Well, Titan has an atmosphere, unlike the others which don't have an atmosphere. Titan has an atmosphere, so it's fuzzy because it's got an atmosphere and you can't see the surface of Titan. Whereas you can see the surface of the other moons. 
All right. So, um, one of the ways to determine the composition of a body is by taking samples, right? I mean, if you really want to know what something's made out of, you go take a chunk of it, you examine it, you put it through a mass spectrometer and things like that to find out what it's all made out of. But, you know, it's kind of hard to do that. We've had landers that went to the moon. Um, we've had landers that went to Var Venus, Mars, and Titan. We have never, the moon's the only one we've actually brought samples back to Earth. We've had to send to Venus, Mars, and Titan the equipment that's going to do the analysis on the surface, right? You can't send rocks back to analyze them here. You can't send samples back. So we've had to send the mass spectrometer, if you will, or the infrared spectrometer out with the robot. So you take the sample and you analyze it right there on the surface. Another way we can begin to kind of analyze some of it is to look at what light it reflects. Because if you think about um, what we talked about in terms of spectra before, we have the emission spectra from our sun. And that goes off, and in this case, it hits Titan. And Titan is then going to have an absorption spectra. Right? And so when we look at Titan, there are three things involved. There's the emission spectra from our sun, the absorption spectra from Titan's atmosphere, and then there's the absorption spectrum from our own atmosphere. So if you look at this graph here, what you see is there's this dip in the spectrum right here where methane is absorbing light. And then there's a little dip here that's due to our sun, a little dip here that's due to our atmosphere, and then there's this other dip here in the spectra that's due to um, methane on Titan. So we could just use spectroscopy and um, sunlight reflected off the Titan to sort out that, oh wow, it has a methane atmosphere. All right? Methane atmosphere in Titan. When we look at Europa, we can see the reflection off of its surface and we get a spectrum there that's consistent with ice, water ice in this instance. All right. So there are other objects out there. They're not just the planets and the moons. There are other things. Um, there are the asteroids in the inner solar system. So what do you think the asteroids in the inner solar system are going to be made up of? Do you think it's going to be rocks and metals? Do you think it's going to be ice? Do you think it's going to be gas and dust? Take a moment to think about that you'll probably see this question again. Well, the asteroids along with the inner planets and moons are small objects and they're chunks of rock left over from the formation of the solar system. In fact, the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, which is where most of the asteroids are, um, they're a collection of sizes, kilometers to nearly a thousand kilometers. Then there are smaller bits here and there. These are all objects that they formed, um, they formed together because of gravity. But other than Vespa and Ceres, which are the protoplanets or the uh, dwarf planets in the asteroid belt, none of them have gotten big enough to become round. And one of the reasons the asteroid belt has never quite formed into a planet is Jupiter. Jupiter keeps messing with the asteroid belt all the time and keeps it kind of from coalescing into a planet. There are other objects out there, out beyond Neptune. So these trans-Neptune objects, what do you think they're going to be mad off of? You think they're going to be rocks and metals, ices, air, gas, and dust? All right, these are objects that are out there past Neptune. Well, it turns out they're mostly... Um, they're mostly ices left over from the formation of the solar system, all right? All kinds of uh, different liquid ice, methane ice, uh, ammonia ice, all kinds of different ices from the formation of the solar system. And if you look at the solar system, here we have Neptune. Well, this more eccentric orbit is Pluto, and this is Eris. 
then there are comets like Halley's Comet, which doesn't go very far out. But most cometary orbits go way out past the, past the Cooper Belt, which is out here at the edge of the solar system, icy objects out at the edge of the solar system, and out into the Oort cloud. The first two trans-Neptunian Neptunian objects discovered were Pluto and Charon, right? Pluto and Charon. Um, largest is Eris. Eris is, has a very eccentric orbit. Makimaki, Haumea, you know, some of these you can kind of guess where they were discovered from. Sedna, um, some we haven't even gotten around to naming. 2007 OR10, right? These are in highly eccentric orbits. Some of them, some of them may have been stolen from another star once upon a time in our history a long long time ago but for the most part they're just trans-Neptunian objects that are out there in their bizarre orbits. Um, comets are the ones, comets start out way out in the Oort cloud for the most part and most comets we see we'll only see once in our lifetime. Very few comets visit more than uh, visit often enough for you to see them more than once in a lifetime. Even Halley's Comet at every 75 years, kind of stretching it. You have to see it as a young child and then seeing it as an old adult um, to see it twice. Um, as comets come into the solar system or get closer to the sun, they heat up. There's a white tail that's ice particles falling off of the comet and then there's a bluish tail sometimes that's due to the sunlight actually hitting gases and knocking them off so this is this is if you look at this ice tail the white tail points along the track of the comet the blue points directly away from the sun the Oort cloud which I've already mentioned once is way out there All right, we have the solar system in here we have the Kuiper Belt right here, and then out here, the Oort Cloud. And here, this is an illustration of a typical comet path. Comets, for the most part, are things way out in the Oort Cloud that got displaced and thrown into the inner solar system. All right. I will um, we'll start the next segment with that question. All right, talk to you in a bit.